Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming um, to our what will be a wonderful event today. And uh, just a couple things about how this will work is uh, would um, we are webcasting this live uh, as well, and uh, I'm sure there'll be people in Cuba watching this joke. <laughs> and uh, so it means that people in the audience can also ask who are watching on the internet. If you stay around for the Q and A, you'll be able to ask questions by following the directions on your screen for how you can uh, lob some questions in. We've actually already gotten some questions online for Joe. And for those of you who are here, uh, obviously you'll be able to just raise your hand and ask questions during the, the Q&A. Uh, no Joe? <laughs> no haircuts. No haircuts. Uh, it's a great video. Um, and Joe and I will talk for a few minutes, and then we'll open it up for for uh, questions from the audience, both live and, and here in the audience. And I want to just begin, I'm Simon Rosenberg from NDN, and I want to begin with just a little bit of background before we get into the heart of the matter here, which is the, the future of Cuba and US policy towards uh, Cuba, is that N NDN is a center-left think tank uh, here in Washington, DC. Uh, we, seven years ago, we began, with the help of Bob Menendez and Ken Salazar and, and many others, uh, began to make an argument that the, the rising uh, Hispanic population in the United States was going to contribute to a new politics emerging in America. And that we began by working with Sergio Ben Dixon and others to sort of help educate uh, many in the political elite about sort of just the, the basic reality of this uh, rising Hispanic population and these sort of significant demographic changes that were taking place. We then, in 2004, under a slightly different organization, a slightly different organizational structure, ran one of the largest minority-oriented media campaigns, a six million dollar Spanish language campaign, including almost three million dollars in Florida, and we'll be showing you one of those ads in a few minutes, um, which was one of the largest engagements in Spanish that had taken place in the history of the country. The next step was that we became a leader in the immigration fight, which was obviously a manifestation of this demographic change. But from the very beginning, there was always an, a, an awareness on our end that one of the consequences of this rising Hispanic population in the US was that we were becoming, we have become the third largest Latin population of all the countries in the Americas, that only Mexico and Brazil have larger Latin populations, and that our identity as a nation over time was going to become increasingly Latin. That, and that it was inevitable because of that that we would turn our attention domestically, geopolitically, towards our neighbors, our Latin neighbors to the South. Uh, and that the South and, the, and that hemispheric relations would become not only more important from a foreign policy standpoint, but also from, in terms of domestic policy. And uh, that this was inexorable and inevitable based on the demographic changes happening in the United States. And so from when we began this seven years ago, there was always an understanding that we would develop a Latin American policy program here at NDN. And what I'm excited to be able to report to you is that within the last several months, we've sort of officially soft launched, if you want to call it that, something we're calling the Latin American Policy Initiative which will be a much more formal, structured Latin American policy program that's now going to be chaired by Nelson Cunningham, who many of you know, who was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately couldn't make it, so I'm filling in for, for Nelson. Uh, one of the areas that we engaged in, uh, going back all the way back to when Joe and I first met in, the, uh, in, the, in 2004, was this idea of creating a new policy towards Cuba and that the policy that the United States had practiced since the 1950s is a manifest failure on, on virtually every way that you could evaluate it, and that we needed a new approach. And our entry into this space, you know, Joe came on board in the summer of 2004, uh, and so our engagement in this space started at that time. Uh, Joe had been the former head uh, executive director of the Cuban American National Foundation, um, had served in other capacities that we could go through and talk about. Uh, but in terms of this discussion today, Joe has been a lifetime fighter and advocate for a free and democratic Cuba, 
and, and one of the most, I think, effective uh, voices and advocates in this debate in both Spanish and English. Uh, and uh, it's a lot more civil in English, I think, Joe, than it is in Cuban Spanish down in Miami. But um, we're lucky to have Joe today. He's no longer working with NDN. Um, in, he is, though, uh, a fellow here. I mean, he's not a formal staffer, but a fellow with us. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about where this goes and, and, I, and where this is going now. Because obviously, there's been a momentous set of events recently uh, in, in regard to Cuba. And, and what I want to end with in my opening comment is that um, the reason we're so invested here about what's happening right now is that the whole idea that Barack Obama's administration has been pursuing by starting with travel and remittances and sort of this incremental approach was created out of this organization. I mean, we were the ones who put this on the table back in the fall of 2006 as sort of a go-forward strategy. Joe was instrumental in, in getting this into the Obama campaign during the 2007 uh, and what we're excited about is we're seeing what we hoped to come about, which is we're starting to see a shift, we're starting to see a change. And you also have, importantly, the buy-in of a large degree of the Cuban-American population down in, in Florida, which is South Florida, which was critical for this being a sustainable enterprise. So ex for those of us who care about this issue, who care about better hemispheric relations, this is obviously a very exciting time. And, uh, and so, Joe, thank you for being, being with us. And um, the, what I'd love to start with, Joe, and I've just got a couple questions just to tee this off, if you don't mind, is, you know, you worked with us here at NDN. You were, you know, obviously uh, had been with CANF and you're on the board still of, of the Cuban American National Foundation. You know, we were both early advocates and worked closely together uh, about this new approach towards Cuba. I mean, tell us, you know, reflecting now back on what's happened over the last few months, how's it going? I mean, what do, what do you think? Well, let me, uh, let me just uh, begin by saying uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for NDN for hosting uh, me. Uh, uh, thanks to a lot of my friends that are in the audience that are Washingtonians. Had a good chance to catch up with a few of them. And, uh, and thank you, Simon, because I think, um, you know, what's good about you, Simon, is you always take credit regardless. <laughs> but, I, but it sounds better if a third party can do it also. And there is no question that, that Simon <laughs> saw from a Washington perspective how to thread the needle. And, um, you know, uh, we, you were at the uh, CFR conference uh, with uh, Julia Swig on Monday, as I was. And part of the, the dynamic of the sort of intellectual uh, progressive movement on Cuba has always had a tremendous disconnect from that which they want to affect. And, it's, and, and so uh, for years they've, they've thirsted for moving policy and yes, just been uh, abysmal failures. I'll never forget uh, in uh, 2000, uh, Jorge Masanto spoke, uh, the chairman of the uh, Cuban American National Foundation, spoke at the Inter American Dialogue. And in his introduction, you know, he talked about all the papers that the Inter American Dialogue had put out on Cuba and other policy positions. And then he introduced Jorge Mas and he said, And you, of course, have been much more successful in shaping U.S. policy <laughs> than we have. We failed. But I think what, what Simon did at NDN was, was thread the needle. Understood, first and foremost, that, that, uh, that Cuba policy is a domestic policy issue, the same way that Israel policy. You could have the greatest ideas on how to settle the Middle East, but if you can't pass muster in the American domestic debate, uh, you're in trouble. And, and I think to some degree, Simon saw that on Cuba policy and trying to craft a center. And so getting to the, the, the credit you deserve for that, our <laughs> campaign, not only in 2004, but in 2006, in fact, Obama's first speech on Cuba policy happened while I was working for NDN and also chairing the Democratic Party of, of uh, Miami-Dade County. And literally, he took, in essence, uh, the, the NDN position that had been laid out on Cuba policy, which he then later reiterated in a few months before the election at the Cuban American National Foundation. So both you and CAMF have a lot of, uh, deserve a lot of credit for this. So going back to the question, I think Obama is succeeding. I think what he's trying to do is keep hold of this center and create a new center on the Cuba question. There is no question that Cuban Americans care greatly about Cuba, uh, but there's also a reality that there's a new dynamic and that Cuban Americans are not monolithic on this issue but that you have to respect the issue and know how to speak about the issue. People who've done that 
people like uh, Senator Bob Graham, uh, who understood the issue, spoke on the issue, had policy positions, was perennially a vice presidential candidate name because not only could he win his Senate seat with, with great comfort, but everyone knew that in the Cuban community he had viability. If Cuban Americans lived in any other state, I'm sure that foreign policy would be very different on Cuba, but they live in a, a key constituency and so it has import. And I think what Barack Obama did is, um, and again, I, I'm not speaking for the administration, this is my thinking about that. I think what he did is he found that, that, that spot. And, as someone who worked at the Cuban American National Foundation for many years, my job used to be to take the Democratic nominee and put him just to the right of the Republican nominee, mm -hmm. and so to, to neutralize the issue. And the reality is that there was no way to get to the right of him anymore, unless we would have had Barack Obama call for the invasion of Cuba, and I didn't see that as a likely <laughs> scenario. But the reality is that there was a lot of space in the South, and, and something that people aren't aware of is that more, the majority of Cubans in the United States today came after 1980. That is, that they've gone through the standard U.S. Immigration Service, which is a 19th century model, which is husband, wife, and children under 18. Because in the 19th century, when you hit 18, you, probably when you hit 16, you married and you left the house. Uh, the reality of the sort of more typical American family is that a family is more extended. Put that into context of Latino community. That's why the immigration system is so tough for them to ma manage, because family doesn't work in the same sense. In other words, uh, when you do polling among Anglos or Americans uh, of, of American of, of English or, or European descent, you ask what is family, uh, immediate family. The average answer is between seven and five. When you ask Latinos or Hispanics the same question, you end up somewhere between fourteen and seventeen. Because, you know, the grandmother goes in there and that second cousin that lives at home all the time. And so that, when applied to Cuba, has created this tremendous linkage. Because the first generation of Cubans got most of their families out by 1980. If they hadn't gotten out, the Marielle boat lift cleared them out. But the new generation that came in Marielle, that came in Guantanamo, and came with the almost quarter of a million Cubans who've come to the United States since 1995 are still linked and so in a typical host house in Cuba where very little new housing has been made, uh, if, if, si if, I was, if Simon was my son and he married, he quite literally brings the wife into the house. And so uh, the reality is I move out of the bigger bedroom, you take that, I, I live in a shack in the back, and we all live together. When you have children, the grandfather raises them and the, the sister that never married or divorced is in that house. And so there's this very extended but very communal living situation. And so here comes U.S. immigration and says, okay, we're going to take the husband, wife, and minor children. And so it's very possible that the aunt that lived at home raised your kid, and so the linkage there is very close, and so it's created much more uh, relationship. Uh, um, and, and I think that by Obama sort of striking this opening, he's creating a re-engagement of that family. And to be quite honest, absent whether you think it worked or not, people are voting with their feet. Uh, travel since April is up. 60%. Remittance is up significantly. And I'm going to make an argument that it isn't that they're that much up. It is that they're not going illegal. Because the, the, it's, it's a fascinating thing when you engage Cuban Americans on this. Because there is a sort of, of, of or was this concept of not going, it would always, it's always excusable for you to go. Yeah, well, I went to see my, my you know, it's my cousin. You know, she grew up at home. I, I know, and so you'd travel through Gang Cayman, Jamaica, uh, uh, Mexico. Now a lot of them are going through South Florida. The flights are booked. I think the, the, one of the charter services is flying a plane that holds 264 people, booked solid every flight. And so people are voting with their feet. And I think what Obama has done by doing that is he's beginning a policy of engagement that makes more sense. The, the announcement of the migratory talks, again, I think the framework of, of Obama's... So can you just, for the audience, can right. you just quickly talk about what the Obama proposal, the Obama policy is, just do a little bit of backfilling on that. Well, I, he, 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 he fir his first policy announcement since president he made in April, which was to remove the, uh, the restrictions that are placed by the Bush administration. Those restrictions limited remittances, 
to $300 per household uh, with direct family and limited travel to once a year, first, uh, first line of consanguinity, meaning you could see anyone in the direct line. So you could go see a brother, a mother, or a grandfather, or a son, but only in that sphere. And remittances were more or less the same thing. If I sent some, uh, $300 to Simon, my son, in Cuba, I could not send another 300 to uh, my granddaughter in that house. And so it limited tremendously. Obama removed those. Uh, and, and this, as a pressure point, we want, and I, and I think NDN's position is, and, and, and we've been stating it, that we want those rules to get out. Because right now people are going, and, and as, a, as a friend of mine who went through the airport, they gave her a hard time. They said, this is the second time you travel in two months. And she said, didn't you see the president? He said, we can go all you want. <laughs> but if you look at the bureaucratic rules, they say now once a year. You know, they're back to pre-Clinton day, uh, Clinton days or 2004 when you could travel once a year. But Obama laid out a very aggressive policy of allowing Cubans to go as often as they want. And, and to be quite honest, I, I say it in a broad way because the, the, the limitation that was put on it uh, was you can go see anyone uh, up to a second cousin. So it's got to be a family visit, which makes, gives it a purposeful nature. You've got to go see your family. Uh, and I think it makes uh, tremendous sense. And then what he also announced um, uh, at the end of, was it last month, was uh, migratory talks. Until 2004, from, 2000, from 95, we had had uh, migration talks with the Cubans. And it's important when you consider Cuba has one of the largest legal migration programs of any country. Uh, approximately 20,000 a year get processed. You add to that those who travel from third countries and enter the country and adjust under the Cuban Adjustment Act, which is somewhere between six and 9,000 a year, give it an average, it's about 30,000, 25,000 a year, at least for the last uh, 10, 12 years. So it's a, it's a big population. So it's necessary to have migratory. It's necessary to have migratory talks for people who commit crimes, therefore are not capable to adjust, therefore are not capable to stay. We can deport them under, under rules. We need to speak with the Cubans. We need to speak to the Cubans because we catch Cubans at high seas. Uh, and we returned them to Cuba. There has to be a relationship. Even though we weren't having migratory talks, a Coast Guard cutter was landing in uh, the Port of Mariel on a weekly basis to drop Cuban rafters that get picked up at the high seas. So we need to have talks. Plus, we need to have talks about people who qualified for immigrant status or refugee status that are inside of Cuba that we are advocating for. And so Obama announced that. And this sets up a framework. There may be some other discussions that occur. Uh, typically, these are very high-level people that go on the part of the Cuban government. Uh, from the U.S., it's usually handled by uh, the Cuba interest, uh, Cuba section folks at the Department of State. But we'll see. But what was good is that the Cubans immediately accepted, and I think it puts us in a good position. And, and we'll see what Obama announces in the next few months. But I think it's particularly important that Obama has not seen himself or the administration pressure to react. Cuba policy has a tendency of being reactive. Something happens, we do something else. Uh, the perfect example was that there were ongoing talks during the Clinton administration to try to create a more normal set of circumstances with Cuba. Uh, and, and Fidel Castro used that moment to brutally murder five people, shoot down two airplanes. And we went from a position of almost engagement to probably the most comprehensive, aggressive series of laws on Cuba ever, which is the Helms-Burton uh, bill, legislation. And part of that, now going back to the politics of that, it is because there is no focal center, there is no group that sort of ha is linked to this, that sometimes policy is reactive. We, we get close, we get far. And by the way, this is how it happens all the time. Uh, Nixon had uh, Kissinger reach out to the Cubans. They were talking. There was almost a sense of normalization. And then uh, Castro invades Angola and, and engages in a, in a war in Africa with his entire army. Uh, Carter had achieved, had literally taken away the, the limits on travel to Cuba. He had, uh, by, by presidential directive, almost lifted the embargo. That's when Fidel Castro chooses the Mario scenario, which creates tremendous havoc. Uh, and the same again with Clinton. Uh, and so we stand at this point where we have to be careful. This, we're not dealing here with, with, with nice guys. But we also have a series of American interests, national interests, that have to be served. Cuba is in our zone of influence. There are over a million Americans of Cuban descent who have interest in Cuba. 
And uh, it is important for us to have some type of co communication. So I think his, his start forward on a, uh, a migratory talks is a very good talk. And I think we're going to see more. So, Joe, if things, if there really is a sense that this is a new day, and even though it's the Castro brothers are still running, running the island, uh, and, but there's a sense that their time is coming to a near end. What's that? Okay, am I leaning the wrong way? Thank you, Tracy. Um, is if we're, if we're sort of seeing this period of Cuban history come to an end, what's the likely scenario over the next 10 to 20 years? I mean, how, what, what are, sort of paint for us a picture of where we could be, where we are likely to be. We've seen other examples of isolated communist-run countries uh, modernized like China has. There's also been, let's say, a less admirable path, the Russian path, right? I mean, we, what happens uh, do, in your mind over the next 10 to, 10 to 20 years? Well, I, I think looking at it from an American point of view, from the United States point of view, I think Cuban Americans are a great asset. They are, they are guarantors to some degree of stability if they are engaged in the process. They are translators to that reality. To this day, for example, when you invest in, in mainland China, if you don't know much, Taiwan remains a touchstone. It remains a place where you go and visit uh, you know, people who understand sort of the Western construct of modern global economy. Or Hong Kong it remains a gateway to foreign investment into mainland China. And, and I think Cuban Americans can serve that role if the circumstances are there. Now, the truth is the conditions inside of Cuba are not that. You know, no foreign enterprise can own a majority stake. In anything, Cubans are disenfranchised by law in ownership and participation in businesses. Uh, all businesses are relatively small and regulated to, to the degree of the number of chairs that a small home restaurant can have. So the Cubans obviously haven't opened that, that possibility. But what we do know from every time that Cuba has been in a crisis and has opened up internally, there has been tremendous productivity. Uh, Cuba at the worst moment in the special period in 94. And the special period was when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cubans no longer had subsidies. Fidel announced that there was a special period. The special period was that there was nothing to eat, in <laughs> essence. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union came to uh, bankroll Cuba to the tune of $5 billion a year. Um, so it was just massive subsidy to keep this island nation at the door of the United States as an adversary relationship. But Raul Castro, Led a, led a fight within the, the Cuban Politburo to open up to small farmers. And almost immediately, food started appearing in the stores. There were something called, uh, the, the term used in Spanish was mayimbe, which it, it, it's a sort of indigenous word meaning uh, some, a, a chieftain or someone who has power. And these were people who were buying agriculture in the country, selling it on the black market or on these open markets, and literally, under Cuba's context, were becoming millionaires. But because Cuba's currency was so valueless, they bought things. In other words, they acquired as much. And so they'd be, there'd be houses where a guy would have 20 VCRs, you know, uh, all sorts of artwork that he'd store because it's the only thing that had value. The Cuban currency during the time was just uh, in free fall. And during part of that time, owning dollars was illegal, so you could even hold dollars. Uh, that period helped Cuba go through a very tough period. And when they were through the tough period, Raul, uh, Fidel asserted his, his power again, and a lot of that disappeared. Uh, Cuba just recently announced that they are maybe entering into another special period. This special period is probably prefaced on the drop of the value of oil. Uh, right now, the Cuba, Cuba's uh, uh, sort of subsidy nation, or the, the country that pays for uh, Cuba's existence to some degree at its level, are the Venezuelans. They export to Cuba huge amounts of oil, Cuba sells a portion of that on the international market and gets a good deal of money. And it is, it's made a substantive difference in Cuba, uh, where in Cuba in the, in the 90s, blackouts were standard. Blackouts are no longer standard uh, in Cuba. And uh, part of what this special period will require, and they're trying to sort of sell it almost as a green effect or efficiency effect, is we've got we've to get people to stop using electricity. So to some degree, we're heading into that, a, a special period like that, and I think it is a good time for this investment from Cuban Americans, which is very direct at a people-to-people at a -people level that can have, I think, a, a great impact. So just to go back to the question, 
scenario planning? Are 10 years from now, is it, are we looking at North Korea? Are we looking at China? Are we looking at Russia? Are we looking at China, Vietnam? Are we looking at Russia? What's the, how does this evolve? Look, I, I don't, I don't, I think Cuba is very different from China. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the Chinese have a long history and, and, you know, this is the oldest civilization in the world. Uh, uh, and, and there are archetypes to, to Chinese culture that don't exist in Cuba. Cuba is a very adaptive country. Because it has been the victim of foreign, in, you know, the, the French have owned Cuba, the Spanish have owned Cuba, the English have owned Cuba. Uh, according to Castro, and, and probably true, we've owned Cuba for a period of, of history as Americans. So uh, Cubans adapt very quickly. But the being 90 miles from the United States, I just find it very difficult to sort of going into a hermit kingdom type scenario. Uh, secondly, the linkage to the United States is so strong. Probably uh, no country loves the United States more than Cubans because of their history and yet have a more adversarial relationship. The, the perfect example, again, is, is the spies last week that were caught. You know, this is, by the way, this is typical for Cubans. Cubans are not paranoid. You know, it, we wouldn't be if it wasn't that there were people spying on us all the time. <laughs> and this is part of what goes on in, in South Florida. But I think in the next 10 years, if policy is, is allowed to move forward, and leaves a sort of reactive state where it goes from one extreme to another, but it has a, it is moored to something real, which is families, which is business to some degree. We well, understand Cuba did almost $900 million of purchases last year. Cuba is the number one, the United States is Cuba's number one provider of food. 70% of Cuba's ration book is met, met by a product bought in the United States. Now, they're spending a lot of money doing this, but it also is, it has some benefits for U.S. market because it's a good place to get rid of excess commodity. You know, you don't have a natural market. You're not affecting so they can buy and sort of distribute. But what is, what is, what, what the hope is, obviously, is as, as, like all of us here, we hope for a free and democratic Cuba, but we'll see how that works out because I don't think there is a Fidel and Raul Castro that can last 10 years. And I think American policy should be based on trying to affect it. And I think uh, Obama was very clear. He said, we need a, a strategy that works from the top down. We've been looking from a bottom up, bottom down type scenario. You know, how do you change these two or three people that run that system? I don't think you can change Fidel Castro. I think it's pretty clear that our policy has been an abysmal failure for half a century uh, in terms of trying to change Cuba. But what, what is certain is that we've had tremendous effects at the people-to-people -people level, and we can have more with an opening of the system. And I think there are tools within the present administration that can be done, and with the executive, uh, because I, I believe that the executive has much more room to precisely gauge and engage than on a congressional level. Uh, so I think in the next 10 years, we will probably see a much more modern Cuba if We've taken away a lot of their excuses. So I think we've put the pressure inside of Cuba as opposed to the pressure from outside. The United States, I'll use this one line, I, it's important. At, last week, or before last week, Cuba was not a member of the OAS because the United States wouldn't allow it to happen. As of this week, Cuba is not a member of the OAS because it can't be a member because of the conditions, it can't meet conditions, or simply because it doesn't want to. I contend to you that the second argument is much more sustainable for the U.S. to argue that Cuba can't be part of the U.S. because they're not a democracy and they're a human rights violator than to argue we can't let them in because just because that's how we've been. And I think it's a much better position. It's a much easier argument. And it brings that debate into the OAS. It's not that the U.S. doesn't want you here. It's that we want to talk about your human rights. And we have a human rights commission and maybe we should visit Cuba and maybe we should uh, find that you're not a human rights violator. So I think, and, and by the way, I think the OAS is better for it. Not that I agree with everything of the outcome, but Obama has been talking about having more multilateral relationships. And the OAS has been a less than effective uh, tool. NATO has been a very effective tool in Europe. Even though its original purpose has changed tremendously, the OAS should try to play that role because a lot of the multilateral institutions that are developing there are ex exclude the United States the ones that Brazil's running and the Argentinians have played, and obviously uh, Hugo, uh, Hugo Chavez's new sort of ALBA group. But I think that uh, 
making the OAS more effective, I think, is important. And this was a first step. I may not have agreed with how Ambassador Insunza laid it out, but I think it worked out to U.S. Uh, benefit. And I think Hillary Clinton uh, deserves a great deal of credit. I think a lot of us were shocked. And if you read the stories coming out of Cuba, I mean, cutting out of Honduras, it was Cuba has a stunning victory. You know, it was the, the first layout. But when you read the stories, New York Times editorial last week on this was, it was a stunning victory for Hillary. I think we were surprised because we forgot what diplomacy looked like. It, it's taking a series of circumstances and navigating them at a way that you can create a victory without necessarily using what is unquestioned U.S. overwhelming strength and power to force smaller nations to do what we want. But sometimes there are more elegant and artful ways to engage in a dialogue that produces the exact same results without the bruised egos that the last eight years have caused us at the OAS. And we literally entered a very hostile environment. And Secretary Clinton was able to, to take what was a lot of, a lot of lemons and, 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 and turn it into lemonade, which I think is, is a very positive thing for US foreign policy. Before we open it up for questions, Dan, what I'd like to do is uh, show a video. And uh, Dan, is this going to work? Yeah. OK, so in 2004, uh, in the final, you need to bring the lights down. We're gonna, yeah. yeah. If we can get, Meg, can you come over and turn off the lights? Is that in 2004? Let me just put a little bit of context in this before we show this, and then we'll open it up. This is a little bit, a little, be a, a little bit of fun here. Uh, we ran. Uh, turn that on for one second. Let me just, and then we'll turn it up. Um, we ran a, a, a media campaign in Florida that, in Spanish, that went from March until November, and spent three million dollars just in Spanish language media. It was a Obviously, for a small part of the electorate, it's an awful lot of money. And the capstone of it, the end, was a campaign that we ran in South Florida, Miami specific, about Cuba. And this was the first time that the Republican machine, sorry about that, that's me. The Republican machine had been challenged. And maybe there won't be a video. Uh, <laughs> but if you recall that, you know, the 2000 election, and, and let me just I'm going to go on about this for one minute and we'll show the ad, is that in the 2000 election, the presidential election was, it was determined by a five to four vote of the Supreme Court about what happened in Florida. And one of the things that happened in Florida, among the many things that happened in Florida, was that George Bush outspent Al Gore by 10 to 1 in Spanish language media in a state where 7 to 8 percent of the electorate spoke primarily Spanish. If Al Gore had spent half as much as George Bush had spent, he would have been President of the United States, we wouldn't have had the Supreme Court decision, and it wouldn't have been close in Florida. So the inability for the Gore campaign to understand and navigate the politics of Cubans, of South Florida, of Hispanics in Florida, cost him the presidential election. This is not a hypothetical thing. I mean, this issue that we're discussing today is literally what created the Bush presidency. And that, if you all recall, that Jeb Bush, you know, and his entire political base, right, was, was grew out of this Cuban-American community, uh, you know, formerly very Republican community, Cuban-American community in South Florida. So when, in 2004, just four years later, after this, uh, you, know, ser you know, this sort of very difficult experience of what happened in Florida, we decided to take on the machine. And so let me show uh, one of the ads that ran in, I think, do we have the Spanish version, Dan, or the English? We'll play Spanish, and then we'll play the English version. And by the way, this is up on YouTube, so you can watch it uh, yourself, too. Basta ya. Llega un momento que uno no puede seguir cruzado de brazos. Hay que asumir responsabilidades. Ya yo lo hice. ¿Y usted? Dile a los republicanos que paren la demagogia sobre Cuba. So let's play it in English. Caballero, hermano, te aseguro que el año que viene estamos en Cuba 
Basta ya. Y hay un momento que uno no puede ser cruzado de brazos. Hay que asumir la responsabilidad. Ya yo lo ¿Y usted? Dile a los republicanos que paren la demagogia sobre Cuba. Ya, en la radio están diciendo, next year in Cuba with the Republicans. Cuba con los republicanos. Every time the ad runs. It's next year in Cuba with the Republicans, so it's it's uh, it's a uh, so like. But look, in a year where Republicans had the greatest success with Hispanics in the nation, we had a pickup in Florida, and we had a pickup in every one of the states that we ran ads. Even though, on a national basis, it was a blowout. They had spent more money, had a better campaign. Lionel Sosa, you know, had all the money on earth in that campaign, and nonetheless, in Florida and in their base. We made them spend a great deal of money, and in the end, uh, were very successful. Well, and just a, a fun final story is that so these ads were running, and I went down to Miami to see Joe, and just to see if he was okay, right? And uh, and we were eating uh, at a restaurant, and I said, Joe, there's this. We walked out to go to the car, I said, Joe, there's this guy following us, and I was, you know, a little paranoid. I'm down here with my friend Joe, and uh, he said, Well, that's my bodyguard. And I said, what do you mean it's your bodyguard? He said, I've gotten so many death threats at my house uh, since the ads have gone up in the air that I've had, a, I've had to hire a bodyguard. And so for those of us who've worked in regular politics in America, <laughs> you know, dealing with places like Michigan or California ain't nothing like dealing with the politics uh, Joe's had to deal with. But look, uh, that, yeah. that's a milestone. That changed the debate. It made it possible to have the discussion. And I think it's created a whole new foundation on, on the debate on Cuba. And I think uh, it put us in a much better place. By the way, and it is the, the centerpiece of what uh, um, Obama was able to do. I, I want you to understand the math in Florida. First of all, several things have happened. The newer Cubans are far more progressive and are registering Democratic. Voter registration shows that overwhelming. But what's even more important is that there's this sort of formula that uh, if you're a, if you can get as a Democrat, 35 is the, the number. 35% or better of the, of the Cuban community, it makes it almost impossible for Republicans to win statewide because Cuban Americans are within the, the Republican framework, that base vote that you can count on right out of the block. And if you affect that, it's very difficult for, for uh, Republicans to win statewide. A similar analysis is African American community uh, within the Democratic uh, uh, ranks. If you, if you have problems holding your base or getting the, out, the, the African Americans to turn out, it's very difficult to overcome. And it's something that, for example, Charlie Chris worked very hard in his governor race, and you're going to see in this next election to try to affect uh, the Democratic base. So.